In this episode, we're lucky enough to speak with the wonderful Maria of Maria's Mezzanine. As we discuss in the podcast, I met her a long time ago, and she does a marvelous job of helping coordinate local events and curate local shows at small businesses for the benefit of other artists in the area. So I want to talk a bit about how I organize my notes for these sessions. I have a spreadsheet that I call Art on Display Dash Exhibiting. And on that, there is a different page for each one of the locations that I sell consignment or hang art at. On the spreadsheet, I have the date that I put it up, the date that I'm supposed to take it down, who my contact is. I also put the sizes, the price that I'm asking for it, what the locations cut as a percentage is, what I paid to get that piece made, and quantities. Most of the time, it's just one. With that, I'm able to track anytime I have a sale, I can see how profitable that location was. And I can easily see if maybe things have been taken off the wall and I need to go in and replace them with some new pieces. This approach has really helped me easily see which pieces I've already shown in a particular area and if I need to move them around to different regions. Aside from that, I also always create art cards that list my contact information the website where they can buy the piece to pay for it online, as well as a QR code directly to that portion of my website. So with the benefit of Shopify, I'm able to create collections. For example, I have art hanging at Overflow Brewery in St. Pete. So if someone went to overflow.chainassembly.com, they would be able to see the pieces that I have currently hanging on the wall there, and they'll be able to check out from my online store and take the piece with them. This process has reduced the barrier to entry for anyone who wants to buy a piece but doesn't want to deal with cash or Venmo or PayPal. Doing this online checkout system, I feel, has definitely made it easier for me to get more sales with these locations when I'm not around to collect their card with a square reader. And again, this is almost all thanks to Maria and the hard work she does in the area. So let's go ahead and move in to our interview with Maria at Maria's Mezzanine. Today, I am joined by Maria's Mezzanine. Uh, Maria is a wonderful artist in the St. Pete, Tampa Bay area who seems to make it to every single event that's going on all the time. So I'm always impressed with the energy she brings to things. And you can find Maria on Instagram at Maria's Mezzanine, spelled M-R-I-A-S-M-E-Z-Z-A-N-I-N-E. Thanks for joining me, Maria. Thanks for having me, Nick. This is awesome. I'm hoping this becomes something useful for some listeners, some people who are hoping to figure out how to make money as art. So I know every artist kind of makes their money in different ways. So that's kind of what I figured these conversations would be good for. And I know you are probably better at socially engaging with people. And I don't mean on social media, I mean, like just physically meeting up with people and having engaging conversations with people. You're better at that than anyone I know. So I thought you'd be a great person to bring into this. Well, thank you. That's awesome. (laughs) So we were, uh, um, before I started the recording, we were trying to figure out how we met. Uh, I feel like the first time I met you was maybe at Overflow Brewery. Either Overflow or take it a step back to Crafty Fest with Marina. Yeah, so that could have been it, Crafty Fest. Um, Also going even maybe earlier, maybe, well, one of my, er this was probably not the first time we met, but one of the earliest memories I had involving you was over at Project Dark Arts. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Although even before that, so I remember at Project Dark Arts, Jonathan James was there and I recognized him from the Art After Dark event we did at 81 Bay. I feel like 81 Bay was before that, so I must have met you even before that. So maybe it was Crafty Fest. Well, you did stuff with uh, Ryan, formerly known as Terry Navajo and Fringe, right? 
Yes, 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 yes. I I was wondering what happened to Terry Navajo. He moved to uh, a different place, a different state, to Kentucky, I think. Well, I think that's actually a good way to kind of talk about how you got involved with what you're doing, which is curating shows at different breweries and cafes and stuff around the area. So how did you get involved into that? Well, um, basically, it started, um, I had my kids, and then I was painting in the studio and applying to all these different galleries and shows and getting a lot of rejections, like rejections to be, I was like, this is it, I'm not going to apply to any more shows, I'm just going to be an artist in my cave and call it a day. Um, but I applied to Fringe Creative Show and, uh, Terry reached out to me and said, Hey, let's do it. And I was like, okay, cool. So it was like a little shimmer of light, um, at the end of a long, dark hallway. Uh, and then I started working with her and, um, getting my work into the breweries and the little cafe shops and whatnot. Um, and then as Fringe developed, she like as they got more and more businesses on board she needed help um curating different locations so i was like you know i can do that not a problem so i learned you know a bit from her on curating and then everything was super cool and awesome and heading for the right direction and then you know the pandemics happened so everything kind of stopped and a lot of people went different ways after that so uh terry left to go pursue her own interests and in um and you know a lot of businesses were closing um so in light of just trying to keep the community alive after and through the pandemic because you know it's just a lot of people lost hope um i just kind of picked up where she left off and just started doing the curating for the breweries that were still open businesses that were still open and just kind of just did it that way. So, and even still, you know, a lot of, there's just, uh, there's always an ebb and flow of businesses opening and closing. So it's just being there to support the local business, the local artists and go with the tide, you know, <laughs> economic. <Yeah. tide. laughs> so, so tell me which of the businesses you're currently with, uh, or I guess you, if we wanted to define it, that you curate for. Right now I curate Overflow Brewing Company. In St. Pete, Sea Maids Creamery in Seminole Heights, Valhalla in Seminole Heights, um, Seventh Sun Brewery in Seminole Heights, and Bull Market. Um, it's off of Gandhi and Himes in South Tampa. I think that's everybody at the moment. <laughs> Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's definitely a lot, but it's less than it was. So what does it look like when you go into a place and say, hi, my name's Maria. I want to be your art curator. Oh, let me before we go that way. Let me um, voyage in St. Pete Voyage Med Spa. That's the newest one. I mean, oh, forget. yeah, I think I remember you mentioning that one. Yeah. Let me not forget them. Actually, it's kind of the reversed, the reverse of what it is. I haven't been actively seeking new places they have been reaching out to me and so when mm. the place reach out, reaches out to me i'll go and meet with the owners you know see what what they want out of it or if they just want you know to help local artists show their work or if they want to cut a percentage and then just curate the um the walls based on what the owner's expectations are I know a lot of artists and a lot of different styles and a lot of different media. So, you know, if some one place wants, you know, explicit nudity, I can do that. Other places don't necessarily want that. So we can go a different route. Other places don't care. And just like you do you. And so then we just fill the walls as best we can. <laughs> well, what is traditionally the kind of um, cut that the location wants, if there is any kind of tradition for that? Um. So I try to keep, my goal is to always have the artists leave with 100% of their profit. But, you know, the different businesses are set up different ways. For instance, Sea Maid's Creamery uh, takes 30% of sales, whereas Voyage only would take 10% of sales. Um, 
All the other places, I believe, are 100% for the artist as well. Um, so I try to negotiate with them. Sometimes it doesn't go that great. <laughs> but I usually can get them to either be completely for the artist or at least 10%. 10% is not too bad. So Being on, on the receiving side of it, those numbers are all still very agreeable to me as an artist. Right. Um, mostly because, I mean, mostly because... Uh, it always helps to get pieces out of my house. <laughs> so just like having them stored someplace that people will see them uh, makes a benefit. It is a benefit in itself to me. But obviously, yeah, it's always helpful too. But I mean, if they're going to take a cut, we would always just adjust the price accordingly. Right. right. So how, how often do you cycle out art at these locations? And like, do you, and how organized are you with tracking that? So I cycle everything basically about every two months or so. Voyage likes it likes to be rotated out every three months. So it's more of a quarterly exchange. But then there's some like um, Valhalla would likes to have fresh work on the walls every month. So I cycle them out once a month. I have a spreadsheet <laughs> that tracks everything. <laughs> Um, there is that. And I do like sometimes like right now I'm hosting a, a show at the Emerald Bar Pride show. And so sometimes I'll have owners reach out and ask if I'll do like a one month show or a two month show, um, either a group show or, you know, a personal show either way. Um, so that's cool. Uh, but usually I try to do every two months with little wiggle room for life events and surprises. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I can always count on you to get me into places. It's all, it almost feels like you're a, you're an art agent for tons of people. I miss And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I know uh, you were taking a cut for a short while and then you kind of stopped with that. Um, I gladly paid it, but um, can I ask why that was? It was at, when I did that, um, I was driving, you know, because I live in Plant City, and um, there came a point where, not none of your pieces, um, but there was a point, um, especially after the pandemic, where I found my studio full of other people's artwork, and not my artwork. <laughs> and I couldn't really produce anything, because it felt really cluttered. And then, like, I ended up just taking piece, people's work from one... Because at, at the time, also, I had some shit places, some walls in like Lakeland. So I would take pieces from Lakeland to St. Pete. And, you know, I just I don't really want to make money off of other people's artwork. I just want to pay for my gas. <laughs> and uh, so and then, you know, I'm not the kind of person to go chase somebody down over 10 percent. So it was kind of like loosely thrown in there. If it didn't happen, I wasn't going to sweat about it. <laughs> Sure. Have you thought about being more of an official art agent? Not really. <laughs> it just kind of happens. I have thought about like how I've ended up having the connections that I have gotten, I guess, over the years. Um, and they're kind of cool how I've ended up in places and met different people and then have the connections that I do have. And I like to share it with other artists. Um, but I also really believe that artists like I'm I'm gonna give you the tools to do it, but I'm not gonna and I'll hold your hand for a little bit, but you know, at some point you gotta fly on your own. Like I'll kick you out of the nest so you can make your own waves. <laughs> I think a good example of that too is uh you have the requirement, which seems like you silly that you even need to announce this, but the requirement that each artist has a way to collect payments on their own. Right. Uh, it must have been pretty frustrating when you were trying to take over that for people. Well, right. And um, uh, in, in part with that, it becomes like a really big tax headache, especially with, you know, the IRS cracking down on electronic um, transactions. If I'm collecting all the electronic payments from people and then giving it out and some people would be like, oh, well, just give me cash. Well, then it looks like you know, on paper that I've collected all the money and it's my profit, which it's not. 
So then it just becomes and uh, it just becomes a really complicated tax spreadsheet, let's just say, of documenting the money that comes in, the money where it goes. So that's another reason, really the main reason that I really in like kind of stress that, hey, you guys got to collect your own your own monies <laughs> because having to go in and out of, you know, in Venmo, out Cash App or you know, either of those ways or whatever, it, um, it just gets, and I don't even know if I should be super stressed about it, but I am just stressed about it. <laughs> well, I mean, just one thing in itself, if, if PayPal notices you doing too many friends and family transactions per month, right. it can lock your account. And, um, right. So let's talk about your art specifically then. Uh, what process do you use to collect sales when your art is hanging at a a uh, brewery or a location or a uh, temp gallery. I use the same as um, I, you know, encourage other artists to use. I put my Venmo cash app, and I do put my phone number out there, and I do tell them I will accept a Zelle should they choose to do that. I also always accept cash. That's cool too. Uh, it just depends on the location that I will accept cash. Sure. So, and then also some. Not all the places, but some places, like for instance, Sea Maids, in an, which is separate than all the other ones, they will collect the payment for the artist, and then they will transfer me the money. So I'm still kind of doing that, and then I transfer it to everybody else with them. <laughs> but uh, we haven't figured out a different way to do it over there differently as of right now. But yeah, I just use a regular Venmo Cash App. I don't really use PayPal because I use PayPal for other things, but I like to keep those separate. It helps me track things better. I could say personally, what I do is um, on because my online store is built on Shopify, I'm able to create a collection, which is kind of just like a kind of landing page that lists a bunch of different art or a bunch of different products that are tied to that collection. So I create a collection for each one of the locations that I have art hanging in. And I create a QR code for it that I put on the art labels. And so when yeah. people scan that, it takes them to that section of my website that lists the art that is currently on the wall, in addition to art that has sold. So that way they can see things that are no longer available, but they can still get a sense of what is things that I have made in the past. So I just kind of, I also like bringing them to my website because then it kind of helps build my branding for that specifically. Yeah, I'm actually a little jelly of your, all that. Because I was like, that's so cool. One day, maybe I'll have time to sit in front of the computer and do that. But, you know, probably not. Well, <laughs> you do have Square, right? I do have Square. Yes, yeah. I so do. Square does allow you to create very basic but free online stores. I don't know if you've played yes. with that yet. I have. I have. Again, I could. I, 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 I have the capability to do so. I just lack the hours in the day. I totally understand that, uh, especially considering you've got some children running around. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So let's uh, talk a bit about um, the art that you sell specifically. Do you ever do prints or uh, have you just basically just done paintings? Um, So, I mean, it's been a long progression. I have done two print runs in my the history of printing from for my work. So I guess they're limited edition print runs. I still have about 11 left of the one print. But for me, I don't think they sell as quickly as other people's work does. And it's just really also really hard for me to, well, not anymore, but it used to be really difficult for me to, and sometimes it still is, take a picture of my work. It's because it's super, super shiny and there's lots of reflections. But I don't know, just prints never really moved like they would move for other people. So I just kind of stuck with original work, regardless of size. I really, I mean, I definitely understand that being this case with your work, because you produce paintings pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, so you have a large body of work, and when you're even just doing like a small event, you'll be there with maybe 20 paintings. When people approach your art setup, I imagine they approach it wanting to leave with a, an original piece rather than a print of something because it, it just seems so much more approachable with your setup to get an original piece. 
Yeah. And I mean, I do like the selling, one of the, you know, things I can say is like, you know, there's, there's only one of each in the world. There's no reproductions of any size. So sometimes that makes people feel a little bit more special about the piece that they're taking home. <laughs> so how do you approach pricing of your pieces? I've just heard, just determined that I just go by size. Um, it's, it makes more sense to me. Um, I guess size and I know I shouldn't be emotionally connected to pieces, but if I am, then the price is a little bit higher because I really don't want it to sell. I like, uh, I mean, again, I know that's like a no, no. Well, why would you think that's a no, no? I don't know. It's just, you know, at the end of the day, a painting is an object and yeah. And then, you know, I have put time and effort and thought and all that good stuff in it um and i have done it for all the paintings but sometimes there are just some of them are just a little bit you know i don't know closer to my heart <laughs> so i understand what you're saying about having the emotional connection to pieces and you being sad to see them go yeah but in my case i rarely ever hang my own art so do you hang your own art yeah okay Okay, so then, yeah, I can see that being more of a reason for you wanting to not let something go. Right. I mean, well, and there's pieces that are still at my house that have never left. And so one day they will leave because I'll be like, oh, I don't have any more. I need that. I'll just grab it off the wall and take it out and then realize that, you know, hey, it needed to go out. And now I have space to make something new or like, at, for instance, at Overflow. If I accidentally forget to label one of my paintings, <laughs> it's not necessarily that I accidentally got to, it's that I really like it. So I'll get, of course, I'll get a question. The bartender will text me like, hey, this doesn't have a label. How much is it? Someone wants it. So I'll throw a number out there and then that's the number that I'm okay with letting it go at. So if someone wants to buy it at that number, cool. <laughs> Those are always fun problems to have. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, that's not really a linear answer. I understand, but it's not a linear conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one thing I was wondering too, that kind of came up with a conversation with another artist is, um, how do you reckon with pieces that you've held for years? Do you kind of keep something out of the sales counter if you will or do you kind of like cycle what you bring to an event do you bring like very old stuff and new stuff is it random i don't know if you have any kind of like chrono chronological approach to that there are a couple pieces that have gone out into the world but i was reluctant to do so but and, and people really like them but i did i still don't necessarily want to sell them unless it's a really great offer but yeah i do cycle some of my older work out of there zeal is the i don't know if you've ever seen her but if you ever see zeal she's a 48 by 26 inch painting she's not well she was bought and then given to me as a present so <laughs> that's the kind of but anyways but like yeah i'll i'll take some of the work out and not really any chronological order. Also a lot of paintings that except for zeal and void, but like other paintings that are older, sometimes they don't really last along at my house. So the work is always constantly being repainted. So if, if you have a piece that you feel like it, it's been shown many times and it doesn't really seem like the audience is receptive to it, you'll paint over it. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, actually, recently I had a, I, well, not recently, I guess. At the end of last year, I was going through a, I'm going to paint over everything kind of phase. And so I made sure that everything that I wanted, that I didn't want to paint over was out of the house. So someone could see it. Um, but it wasn't within my grasp, per se, that I couldn't just walk in the house, pull it off the wall, then pour paint all over it. <laughs> So, um, and then even with, I have a solo show coming up uh, in two weeks for Disco Dolls, well, at Disco Dolls, um, even though I had 
plenty of work that could have gone into that show. I felt like some of the pieces had been shown too many times. And so they got redone a little bit. <laughs> so how often do you feel like you develop an audience through your social media? Like your do you have people who follow you on Instagram and then try and show up at your shows? Or do you feel like it almost all is just people you've met in person? I have not. Well, no, I did meet someone who followed me on Instagram and then came to my show. That was weird experience um, in like a good way. I just never have never not met somebody. And then they'd be like, oh, I know who you are. I follow you on social media. Well, I know like most people know you because they've met you in person or been to a show that you've organized. I know your online presence isn't really the biggest. That's kind of why I was thinking of that question. Yeah, no, I would I would agree. It's mostly people that I've met in person over the years. Do you want to have a bigger online presence, do online sales, stuff like that? I mean, I dabbled in it a little bit and I've never actually made a sale online. I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it at the moment. I mean, sure, if if some if it was able to, but I don't know. I still have to wrap my head around that for my personal work anyways. Sure. I really admire those who have been able to do that effectively and efficiently. So I didn't like even like I want I always like I like was it what's that site? Um mm -hmm. Etsy. Um, I had tried, I, I had tried to, to like set up an Etsy shop with, like six years ago. And there was something that was always, that always bothered me. Like when I got into the last step of setting it up, so I never actually did it. <laughs> and I feel Etsy is more of a site for like crafting things. I don't, I don't know. If, I mean, I know people who do sell their paintings on, on Etsy and again, awesome for them. <laughs> My biggest gripe with Etsy, uh, yes, I use it. And yes, I make a decent amount of sales of my tarot decks. But my biggest gripe is anyone who buys a Maria painting on Etsy, they're going to think of right. it as something they bought from Etsy, not something they bought from Maria. Right. So have you done any, uh, for lack of a better term, merchandising of your paintings? Not really. I always kind of like wish that I, I did. I mean, I made stickers. That's, that's merchandising. <laughs> <laughs> but stickers is as far as it went, you know, for instance, Mark Williams merchandise, like he's got shirts and bags and backpacks and cool purses. And he's got his own line of clothing and all that. And that is awesome. I tried to figure that out. And I got a really bad migraine. So I stepped away from the computer. <laughs> It's just, it's not for me, I guess. I think one thing that could work pretty uh, well is somewhere between the two where you could still do original things, but still get people excited on, I guess, owning a piece of Maria's art. Right. I could imagine some type of situation where maybe you're selling like blind box, smaller painting, maybe. I, I know your paintings don't usually get that small, but... I, I could imagine someone buying, like, you get a box and you don't know what the painting's going to look like. They open it up. It's a surprise. Um, maybe they just choose, like, a color or two to match their uh, aesthetic or something. I could imagine that <laughs> being a, a, a good, successful kind of way to... Well, that's how I do commissions, really. When I do get commissions, it's basically pick a color and or a set of colors and it want you want the figures to be in any specific kind of pose you want one figure multiple figures that's that's how i run the commission so that would make sense i did um for a little while have some smaller pieces in those uh, lucid vending vending machines i also had stickers in those machines the stickers sold quicker than the pieces i had some stuff through those vending machines for a while but uh, slowly they kind of phased me out of them and I got the sense that they really just wanted to sell their own stuff right? as they started kind of making cheaper, uh, cheaper items to put in there. So I no longer right. really kind of consider those as a viable option, at least for me personally. So I stopped tracking that. Yeah. So what percentage of your business income would you say is commission based and what percentage is just sales of your unprompted paintings? 
I'm just going to go over the years, like a general, I say over the years, it's been about 50, 50. So I'm going to accumulate the last six years of art there. Like, and every year has been very different. You know, obviously the economy is doing wacky things. There was one year that I had a, 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 I guess you'd call him a patron. And so he would just, I would just do commissions for him all year long. And that was pretty much all that happened that year. (laughs) But then, you know, then I guess, you know, life happens and you drifted away. Yeah, not 50-50. I think that's pretty great, especially considering that when you do a commission, it's generally you're still still your same style of painting, right? Usually. um, Well, most of the time. Sometimes I get a little weird and challenge myself. I have done a couple portrait commissions, which is very challenging for me, but I get it done. (laughs) And it's still kind of in my style, but it's still very much a portrait at the end of the day. And then I did a Star Wars commission. Oh. Yeah. It was was like a six-piece series. They were really, really big. Again, in my style, but it was very much the Death Star and don't hate me. I don't know the name of those planes that fly around. <laughs> the one with Luke and, and the droid in it. Yeah, I know. I have that. Whatever, whatever plane is that one is in space. <laughs> so let's talk about art markets. Uh, when you do kind of pop-up events, what does your setup typically look like? Over the years, it has changed as well but usually i'll have like grid walls that hang from the tent started like plastic lattice from home depot and then i upgraded to the grid walls and depending on the event depends on how they get hung from the tent so if it's like an event where people are going to be wanting to walk into the tent then i put them around the edge so it's like a box So they have more of an entrance and an exit. Or sometimes I'll hang them like from the center of the tent and like a T kind of fashion so people can walk around it. So it's kind of like a mini gallery. But I always, I usually always have my painting station around there. So it's either off to the side or directly in the center, you know. Depending on the event. And to clarify, my painting station means you're live painting at events. If, if there's ever a chance yeah. for you to do live painting, you're going to be live painting, right? Yes, most definitely. Do you find that kind of gets in the way of you talking with potential customers and making sales? Probably. It probably does. <laughs> but, but I enjoy it. And um, I think it kind of adds a little bit of a spectacle to the whole thing. I'd rather do a stage. And then people will just stare at me on the stage, but <laughs> painting, <laughs> painting <on> stage, <laughs> it's clarified. Well, it's funny because like, e- even if it's a terrible event, you make no sales, you could be, well, at least I completed these paintings. Right, right. I've noticed personally with the events that I've attended over the years, the chances of me making no money has slimmed. I don't know if it's because people recognize me or because I've gotten better at picking events or my booth setup is just so much more attractive. Probably a mix of all three. Have you noticed like an upwards trend in the events you do or do you, have you gotten not really as well? I guess you don't go to events so much to make a lot of profit as much as I do. Right. I feel like maybe you're more there for the camaraderie, the um, event itself. I don't know. Is that accurate? That's that's pretty much more accurate. Um, again, it's been an evolution over the years. And I know we had a conversation a little bit not too long ago where you said that you changed the, the like the signage on your tent and it really did a, a great like great boost in your sales for that. And I think that's freaking genius. And I, I think, you know, there was a, a, a time where it was for me, you know, trying to boost as many sales as possible. But I for me anyways, it kind of, I don't know, it, it's just a weird thing. I think you are really, really great on the branding. Like you, if anybody sees your sticker or your tent or even like a color palette, like that's chain assembly. Thank it's you. Nick Rivera. <laughs> and just like beeline towards it. You've done a really good job. I always envy the amount of like personal connections that you can make with people. You're, you're way better at 
customer service and uh, genuineness than I am. I'm terrible at remembering people. I'm terrible at remembering when I spoke to someone. I regularly have people come up to my booth saying, hey, Nick, how's it going? I haven't seen you in forever. And I'm like, hey, person. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have a completely different corner of the market, uh, different, yeah, portion of the market cornered. I don't know. You're a lot better at what you do, and I envy that. Right, right. You know, I mean, art and art market, it's got all these different sides and we all bring our little piece to the table. So I know you can't, you couldn't possibly go to every event that's happening in Tampa Bay. So what are some things that would be red flags for an event? As in, I'm not going to go to that? Yeah, sorry. Yes. Well, like, I'm not going to attend it as an artist or I'm not going to go. You're not going to set up shop and try and uh, live paint and sell stuff. First. I look at who it's being marketed towards. For instance, if an event, while it seems really cool, I don't know, hold on, let me think of the words I'm trying to say. Like, you know, who is it marketed for? If your intention is to sell artwork, maybe you, and well, and also depending on what you're selling, because people have to carry around what they purchase. So I think sometimes that's something that, it needs to go into consideration. Also, for me now, it's the heat. I will not set up a tent in the Florida heat. I'm sorry. It is too hot. I don't know if I'm just getting old or what, but it is hot outside. <laughs> I know what you mean. I spoke to an artist in another uh, episode recently who's in Orlando, and that was also something she struggles with. Uh, I feel like because I play so many disc golf tournaments around Florida, I've gotten a bit more comfortable in ridiculously hot heat. Right. But that being said, there's also fewer markets happening around Florida this time of year. Right. I mean, I used to um, five years ago, or was it Marcus is seven, so maybe six years ago, six or seven years ago, I was like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go out in the Florida heat. And it was so hot. And those are the markets that had the fewest people walking around. So, you know, I kind of just learned from that. Also, during the summer, it's hurricane season and a lot of things get rained out. Um, so also something I look for is like the time of day. Like in the past, I would just wake up and at whatever time and, you know, do back to back markets. But then so there's a couple, not the, I guess the year before the pandemic, I was like, well, I don't really like waking up early in the morning. So I'm going to pick events that are in the evening typically around alcoholic beverages <laughs> because people like to buy things they're drinking <laughs> sometimes usually but you know and then this year my um, our living situation has changed again so now we're early morning people <laughs> so you know it's just a fluctuation of what works best for the individual in general you know well it's funny you bring up uh doing a market around alcoholic beverages like anytime i see something that's like craft beer and art festival or barbecue and art festival nobody's gonna buy art because their hands are gonna be busy drinking beer and eating barbecue through that but if yeah if it's an event that has a bar and there's vendors then that's definitely a great event right I mean, I did like, I did the Scallop Festival in Crystal River one year. Oh, that sounds fun. It was really fun. And my tent was right behind the Scallop competition. And I got all the free samples of all the freaking scallops. It was awesome. I didn't even know that was a thing. I love scallops. I'm going to look that up. (laughs) It's really awesome. I can pull the name of the guy who runs it for you, who's like in charge of it if you want. But it was really fun. Again, it is in Crystal River, so it was like a, and it's a two day event, so it was like an overnight thing for me. But I had a great time. I sold my booth fee, so I was happy and I got free food. So, what would you say is the most successful event you've sold at? The most successful event that I have sold at in was the Art After No, not it wasn't called Art. It was the Crash Landing at Eighty One Bay before the pandemic shut down. Wow. I don't know what was happening. And that and so like I kind of joke with myself. I'm like, if I I made a lot of money that day. Like that evening. I was like I was like super happy, but really confused. And then like the next day everything shut down. 
So I was like, so that's my omen. If I do really well, the world will shut down the next day. (laughs) Now, I I remember, so (laughs) it's funny you bring that up. So one event that I remember seeing you at that I wasn't vending at was the, um, was a pride event a couple years ago and your booth was packed. Did that translate to sales? The one in Pinellas Park. Um, I mean, for we, I did okay that during that event, but nothing like overwhelmingly. It was like there was people in that tent. Also, that tent was was split between four artists. Oh, that's right. So, yeah, that's yeah. right. I remember there were was, a lot of you in there. It was crowded. <laughs> so maybe those three of them were other artists, not customers. <laughs> right. I mean, but there was still a lot of people in, in and out of the tent. There's a lot of people in general that, that year, that event. But yeah, it was a great event as well. I believe we, we did well, you know, not, again, nothing crazy to write home about, but we did pretty well. Yeah, sometimes an event is so fun. You don't even worry about the sales. <laughs> right, exactly. And then, you know, and then it's like, oh, my God, we just, you know, made our booth be back. Awesome. But we had so much fun doing it. Who cares? <laughs> there was a, a winter event in my neighborhood I organized last year, Winter in the Wood, because I live in the Kenwood neighborhood. And uh, yeah. like sales wise, I don't think I did that great. Like I probably like half of what has become my normal average in the last year. But I spent all year organizing that event with three other people and we just nailed everything perfectly. We had all of the local musicians from the neighborhood playing like Christmas songs. And nice. it was just such a wonderful, like it felt like a Hallmark Christmas movie and nice. we were all drunk. Cause we, <laughs> we had like a little secret <laughs> under the table, um, spiced wine competition. <laughs> and so we just had such a good time. Plus it was only like three blocks from the house. So the fact that my sales weren't that, Great. I didn't really care. I, right. I can understand moments when you don't really worry too much about sales. Right. Right. One thing I've noticed too is if a sale is, uh, sorry, if an event is very regular, like once a month, that's going to translate to pretty bad sales. Right. Which is wild because like, if you want to think about Art Walk as an event, a lot of people I've talked to who have vended at Art Walk or people who have galleries that are part of an Art Walk, that doesn't really right. translate to great sales for them either. But it's better than sales on just any non-art walk day. So, like, for example, the, I've done that Pinellas Park event and multiple times, and I hardly right. ever make any sales. But there was one day that a band was playing with a whole bunch of young 20-year-olds, and I made tons of money because a whole bunch of 20-year-olds showed up, and that's my target demographic. I had no idea who right. that band was or what reason they were there because they don't usually have bands playing at that area of the stage. But it was just a great night for me for some reason. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Do you have any plans in the future on how you want your art business to grow? I mean, I want it to grow, definitely. We'll just see. I find it most satisfying when, like, because my work is, is, it's different. And I notice that a lot of people don't really know what they're looking at, which is fine, because art is just to be whatever... I understand that a lot of people don't understand what they're looking at when they're looking at my artwork. So that's cool. But then again, on the other side, people who do see what I intended for them to see, and it's abstract art, so really they could see whatever the hell they want. And they do make the decision to purchase it and take it home. It means that it, they like really connected to it on some kind of, or they're just really drunk, you know, on some kind of level. So that makes me happy. And I hope more people will do that. (laughs) Have you ever tried to have like traditional representation in a gallery? What do you mean? Like, I mean, we did House of Shadows. That was pretty. Well, I mean, like, uh, say, for example, signing an exclusivity contract with a gallery to be your like sole uh, distributor or something. I don't think that's necessarily on my plate. Right. Um, Just because I have. I think I've just been around the block too long. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't like to be that exclusive, I guess is my, would be my main issue. Um, for like, for instance, I was showing, uh, we we're going to show an artist's work and then like the show was hung and everything. And then we realized that he had, cause he did sign and it was really great for him. 
and I was super happy for him, but he, he signed a contract that said he couldn't show work in a specific county. And, you know, it was, it was okay. We all just took down everything. But I don't think, for me, I would want that kind of limited, I don't think I'm there yet is the word, or I don't want that for my artwork, I guess. I get that. <laughs> I mean, you, you've kind of, uh, maybe on purpose, maybe inadvertently, but you've kind of built this persona where everyone's like, do you know Maria? Oh yeah, I know Maria. Everybody knows Maria. And so <laughs> kind of introducing exclusivity into your art, even if it's in the benefit of growing you as a public figure and like getting you more national recognition or something, all that could be good. Right. At this point, it seems maybe disingenuous to who you are as a person and who you are as an artist. Right. I think, yeah, I think what you're doing is great. And I applaud everything you do for the community. You've helped a lot of artists make a lot of sales, and I hope you've made a lot of sales as a result of all the hard work you've put into it, too. Oh, thanks, Nick. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So uh, do you have any events coming up? Uh, I know you uh, not only do you work as a uh, gallerist at multiple different locations, you also organize a lot of events. So are there any specific events coming up you want to get people's attention pointed towards? Um, we do have Art After Dark coming up in August. Um, we moved, we changed it. It was, it was at 81 Bay. And then once they closed, we moved it to Seventh Sun. And this year, we changed it from a monthly event because we did see that downturn to a triannual event because it's not technically quarterly but it's so it's only in april august and december haha uh -huh. it's going to be in august uh august 18th at seventh sun in seminal heights that is kismet the way art after dark becomes april august and december wow yes. <laughs> uh... i figured if it would if it if it's gonna like and even with art after dark you know because Art After Dark started at 81 Bay to, you know, bring the community together after the pandemic shut down because we needed we needed community and there wasn't anything. And so it filled this void and it was really great. And it's still really great. Sometimes people pr put like profit before. I know this kind of like the antithesis of what this conversation <laughs> is about, but sometimes they put profit before like what it's actually about. Where why it's started and so yeah anyways i was struggling a lot with it but i mean even if art if, even if this is the last year for art after dark it will have served its purpose in the community i hope it's not the last year for, for art after dark but i feel like now for april august and december it's kind of like hopefully that will be something that is it's not every month but yeah there'll be a bunch of artists there um at least 10 local artists uh, painting and vending, and then we'll have a traveling gentleman on stage because they built us a stage, a Seventh Sun, which is awesome. Oh wow! And I will, be, yeah, it's really again, it, everything keeps on evolving. Um, I never know what I'm going to find when I go to Seventh Sun, which is great, like in a good way, not a bad way. But there's a stage, so a, a traveling gentleman will be playing, and I'll be live painting, and there'll be a bunch of other artists live painting, and there'll be beer. And non-alcoholic beverages as well, and a food truck. And it's just a really great time for the community to come together as far as art is concerned and everything else that goes along with it. <laughs> so that that's definitely in August. Um, in two weeks, I have a solo show at Disco Dolls, which is also in Seminole Heights. We have a Pride event at the Emerald Bar, the Pride Show. And there's also a Pride event on... June 24th at Overflow with a couple of fun shows in the evening. And that for right now is all I can think about. Well, I've got two pieces in the uh, Emerald show. Um, <laughs> so Emerald and Overflow are both in St. Petersburg. Um, and you hang art also at uh, Art Pool Gallery? I, I don't hang. I have my work there, um, but I'm... All right. Sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have work at Art Pool as well. Yes. All right. And then so if people want to find these events, you're going to be posting about them on your Instagram, yes. which is at Maria's Mezzanine at M-R-I-A-S-M-E-Z-Z-A-N-I-N-E. -E. Uh, I'm going to put those in the show notes for this podcast, uh, the link to your Instagram, and I'll dig up some of the Facebook links and put those in there, too. Cool. Thanks, Nick. Well, Maria, this was a wonderful conversation. I think we got a lot of good information out of you that will help people 
walk into places to present themselves, promote themselves, and uh, also grow their communities with similar events. So thank you so much again. Um, if you know, if you're a local artist and you're in St. Pete and you happen to be walking around Saturday night and have weird art questions, I bartend Saturday nights at Overflow. You're always welcome to come and ask me weird questions about art. And you're also welcome to buy Maria a beer. Uh, there you go. That too. <laughs> Thank you so much once again. Art for Profit's Sake is recorded through Riverside FM, edited on Adobe Audition, and distributed through Spotify for Podcasters. The music is provided by Old Romans. If you found anything helpful, interesting, or useful in this podcast, please rate and review us five stars. If you want to learn more about Chain Assembly, head on over to chainassembly.com.